of R.K. Creed goes back even further when I was just a kid, and Cindy might remember this, but there used to be an amusement park over there. Oh my gosh, yes. And um, very little information about that amusement park. Thank you, students. The book study has been moved to C as in cat four. <laughs> uh, the book study is, has been moved to C four. <laughs> For some of you uh, may have stumbled upon little revetments of the old little train way over there, but and little drinking fountains, so you still can see evidence of what was a, the amusement park in the 60s. But I, I, uh, I did get interested in Arcade Creek as I was running over there, and um, and then found out that they were going to build parking lots and a huge recreational complex there along Auburn Boulevard. So. That's how I, I basically said that that cannot happen. Though, as, as probably a lot of you know, a lot of those trees over there are two and three hundred years old. Um, I like this big one out here outside the door here. When uh, uh, Native Americans were still um, working this area, and um, so they're, 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 they are a natural and cultural legacy. Um, after going to um, um, Maryland, I got to give a shout out to American River College because I did. When I got out of here, I, a, lot of, a lot of young people can't figure out what they want to do. I had too many things I wanted to do, and I'm like, I got to narrow down the, the list here before I go off to Davis. So I, I had a really good um, education at American River College as well, um, and then did work on, on saving this creek, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Um, after that, uh, because of my citizen activism as a, as a young person and learned about what it took to save something and how to, how to interact with my community, how to interact with local government. And we did end up saving 100 acres over there along the creek, which is now your study area. And when I was just a little bit older than you, I went to the city and said, this could be an outdoor laboratory. This is the laboratory. It could be useful for science and education. And the city said, that you're crazy. That, that is just, that, that's just a wasteland. There's homeless people over there. People are dumping stuff, it's, 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 you, you, that's never going to happen. And the fact that you are all sitting here today and the fact that you have such great teachers, for me, is, is reaffirms that original vision I had and, and just makes me just so, so appreciative of what you've done and all the students before you and all who will come after. Because it is a, actually a very remarkable place. You can go up, and I'm from California, from the valley, you can go up and down the valley and not see um, that kind of habitat in, in, embedded in a, in a suburban matrix, matrix like that hardly anywhere. It is a very special thing, which I think local government still doesn't get. They don't, they don't realize the significance of uh, well, the wildlife over there. Sydney and I were just talking about the, the mysterious coyote population that's probably over there to keeping the um, feral cats at bay. But after doing that, I was hired by the Environmental Protection Agency because they needed somebody who could work with communities on their hazardous waste program. That was when, um, shortly after the Superfund law was passed in, in Congress about um, getting rid of hazardous waste dumps, and we hired a bunch of engineers at EPA, but the engineers didn't know how to interact with people. And the engineers were out cleaning up the hazardous waste and pumping and treating the groundwater but they didn't know how to interact with people. And so every time EPA showed up and said, hey, we're here to help, they would be yelled and screamed out of town. So they needed somebody who understood communities, understood local government. And so I was hired to help start the community involvement program at EPA, even though my heart was really in natural resources, but I thought, I gotta get in the door and then I'll move over. And sure enough, I did end up being involved in the um, water program, the Bay Delta Estuary Project, which I'm going to talk about today. And then I went on to manage the uh, wetlands <coughs> program for the uh, Southwest Pacific region, which is California, Arizona, Nevada, Hawaii, and the Pacific Trust uh, Islands. That's Guam and Samoa and, and places way far away. So I managed that for seven years and then went to a nonprofit organization to direct their restoration on private lands program. And that is how to work with farmers and ranchers to restore creeks and wetlands and stuff on their property and deal with all the permitting challenges. And now I'm back at EPA working on the Bay Delta again. And I'm going to explain today, in 30 minutes or less, 10,000 years of history. Are you ready? And what your role is in the 10,000 years. Can you believe it? Now, I don't have a, um, are we going to do the lights? There we go. So there we are. All the water from, the, that comes out of the Sierra Nevada down the foothills, 
sac down the Sacramento Valley, down the San Joaquin Valley, into the big rivers, out through the delta, out through the bay, and that's where it meets the ocean. And you can see where this meeting point is. I don't know if that's delta water. Okay, Johnny, please call I'm gonna, are you, you 7463. Stop Trust me, I'm going to call 7463. I'm giving a part of my salary to get that thing to shut off. I'm going to notice this every time we're in here. Um, anyway, the, so this is the meeting point, and you can see the difference between the fresh water and the salt water. I'm not sure which is which there. It might be uh, the, the, the fresh water with the sediment discharging out into that ocean. Bottom line is, is that the bay and delta are connected and you're connected with them. But let's find out why, what, what does it matter about California? And this is the, the great part of being a Californian. We are living in one of the most ecologically important places on, in, on the planet. And it's because we live in a Mediterranean climate. And what, what is the characteristics of a Mediterranean climate? Come on, ES. What happens in the winter and what happens in the summer? <laughs> Go ahead. One hundred coins. Put that on your mark. Okay. So yes. Um, now, of course, nature and the planet doesn't know state boundaries here. So actually, the what they call the California Floristic Province goes down to the Gulf, into the into Mexico, and up into Southern Oregon. But this is one of the most special places on the planet for ecological diversity, both plants and, and animals. And there's only about a half dozen of these places worldwide. Chile, South Africa, around the Mediterranean, which is where we get the, the name. Um, and these places are these assemblages of, of, of plants and animals that oftentimes are found nowhere else in the world, like your big, big blue oak tree out here. This is the only place on, on the earth where blue oaks grows is right here in California. And um, they also experienced high levels of of degradation and fragmentation, meaning this wealth of ecological resources is also under grave threat and is disappearing nice. and is being fragmented. So, another. So let's let's turn back the clock to the Pleistocene. Who knows what that is? Do you recognize that? Do you know where that picture was taken? Well, that's drawing. The Central Valley of California, ladies and gentlemen. 10,000 years ago, the saber-toothed tiger, who has a guess of what the state fossil is? I'll give you a hint. Smilodon. Saber-toothed tiger is the state fossil. Um, it's incredible for me to think that these creatures once wandered around in California. And in fact, uh, I did some work, uh, some permitting work for the new UC Merced campus. Um, there, that's a whole other presentation someday. but. Um, when they were doing uh, research on the soils and stuff out there, they found camel bones. Um, when they were doing this, the fourth bore of the, of the, of the, um, the tunnel down there, in, uh, called the Cot Tunnel down in the Bay Area, they found all these crazy animals. Um, this is in the San Francisco Bay Area. You can still see bunch grasses, we remember those, but did you know that we had bison? living in California, and what about these crazy zebra-like wild horses? This is California. This is where we got started. And, and, and we lost them all. We lost them because of climate change and all that stuff. And people say, well, yeah, the climate change today is just, it, it, this, we've always had climate change, yes. We've always had climate change. We've also always had extinction. The point of this is, of what we're talking about now, though, is humans and the human activities are accelerating extinction, accelerating climate change and making it worse. So we're taking natural phenomenons, phenomenons and, and making them you know, much more pronounced. Um, of course, we are, we are not the only ones here. This is Chief Stanislao. Have you heard of Stanislaus County? <coughs> well, we had 20, something like 26 tribes in California. We had a variety of um, Native American tribes. They all had distinct languages. They had uh, trading partnerships and all that. This happens to be um, one of the tribes that was in the Central Valley. So these are the people who were collecting acorns from the big trees, like we talked about. These are the, these are the people who I thought of um, when I first stopped at the, the, the no way we're going to let the city pave over Arcade Creek. Um, it's got too much importance culturally. And here's a map of uh, the, one of the early 
ethnographers mapped out all the different tribal areas that at least that person knew about. I'm sure there were little subsets. Here's, by the way, Tulare Lake, which was the largest freshwater lake in uh, the West, maybe in the, in the United States, actually. Here's San Francisco Bay, and we're going to talk about the Delta. Sacramento Valley here, San Joaquin Valley here, Sierra Nevada, and then the North Coast up here. But anyway, you can see where all these, these, all these different colors in the bottom here are all the different tribes and so forth. So there's a great deal of, of cultural history. We just looked a second ago at um, the Sacramento Valley, and you can see um, the mighty river, the big river, Sacramento River, one of the biggest rivers in the world. And, and the, the snow falls up here in the Cascade Range and the Sierra Range. That's, this is where the two mountain ranges join in. And comes off, comes off this slope. It also comes off this coast range. And down the rivers, down the rivers, and big, 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 big. And that's about where we are right there. And that's where Arcade Creek is. And Arcade Creek feeds into the delta. Up in the, up in the valley, this is a picture I took years ago during one of the big wildflower blooms. This is Lassen and Tehama County. The Sacramento Valley, um, I should say the Central Valley in general, was it, it's, it's formed like a big bathtub really. You have the Coast Range and you've got the Sierra and that big flat part. In its natural condition, that would seasonally flood and probably many times not even seasonally, but it would go year after year. It's just a giant bathtub and there were, it was full of wetlands and full of wildlife. And these are sort of the higher parts where it wasn't like inundated in the low spots. This is sort of on the shoulder going up to the foothills of the Cascade Range. But there were vernal pool ecosystems. Do you, have you seen the vernal pools that are out along Arcade Creek? Have any of you wandered up, one, up on the terraces a little bit? If you, you saw them, um, I can show you them. There were some artificial ones there that were created and some other natural ones that are still present. Um, but they have their own ecology and just like the other specialized plants and animals of, of the Mediterranean zone. Vernal pools have plants and animals that, that occur nowhere else in the world that are very, very um, unique. There's the big... Cody river. Leeper, please meet your mom out in the front. Cody yeah. Leeper, please And I just talked to Rich about it. Just 30 minutes ago. There's a button they can push that only goes big to the river bend. This is about getting ready to cut off. You know, that's what creates oxbows. The river cuts across here because it becomes the place of least resistance. Instead of going all the way around this big turn, it will just sometimes cut off, and that's how you get oxbows. But there's the big Sacramento River. And now we're going to bring it home a little bit. And we're going to look at just the watersheds that are on the east side um, of the Sacramento River and the east side of the Natomas Basin. And I can't read them all here. Auburn Ravine and Merton, or whatever, Markham Ravine, Curry Creek, Pleasant Grove Creek. There's the, the Steelhead Creek. Am I in your way when I, when I stand over here? Now you can see this. Um, Steelhead Creek, it used to be called the East Natoma, or the Natoma's Main Drainage Canal, which wasn't very, very visually interesting. Um, and then here is R.K. Creek, and I was just over in your R.K. Creek room, and I saw that you have this, this map kind of blown up on the wall. But whether you know it or not, and you know it today, you are working on the Bay Delta ecosystem. Because that's, that's, it goes, R.K. Creek flows into that Steelhead Creek, and then is at the confluence down there at the American and Sacramento River. And so the freshwater and the species and stuff that you see up there in the creek actually go down through the Delta and out to San Francisco Bay and then out into the ocean. And um, Mrs. Suchanik talked a little bit about my early activity. This was the result of five years of negotiation. So from when I was like 19 or 20 to when I was 25, 26, spent years on doing all the political negotiation. This is Auburn Boulevard here, Harry Renfrey baseball field there. This was all going to be paid. And it was going to be, there was going to be sports fields and pavement and all kinds of stuff. And we negotiated the settlement of this big area here as a protected area. And that's where you're, that's part of the places that you're, you're studying. Um, and then over here is where the softball complex ended up going. And then this area over here is Arcade Creek. There's Longview Drive up there. Um, but so... I guess the thing, I, I, the point is, is that if you see a natural area, 
it's probably not there by accident. It means like for a natural area like this to occur in a city like this now, it means somebody probably had to work a lot to get it that way. And I did, I have worked a lot, but what we need is people to take it to the next generation. So I, every time I come and get, get the privilege of talking to your classes, I'm, I'm looking for who's going to be the, lead, the creek leaders of the future. And there's a lot that was done to save this creek. There's a lot that needs to be done. It's under threat every day. The, the um, IB students with the RK Creek Project have been instrumental in stopping two major developments over there. I don't know, if, do, do they know this political history? No. Well, this is also why we need to get this on, on your website. But you helped stop um, over on Longview Drive, and I couldn't find a, a map of it, but you stopped a big industrial development, and that now became the Longview Oaks Preserve. That's a seven acre, it was, it was, it was a seven acre piece that... Michael Lineback, please call the main office. Michael Lineback, please call the main office. That's okay. Um, th this was a seven acre area that the city... Um, do, 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 you, do you know where the, where the Sacramento Horsemen's Association is? Along yes. Longview? And then there's that area, that open space area across the way there? Yeah. That's the seven acres. And we tried to protect this back in this during this zone, so during the, all the public meetings and stuff that went on from 1981 to 1984 or so, we fought like hell to get that piece protected, and the city wanted to sell it off and have that turn into a, ho a, ho a hotel, which that hotel ended up getting built on Longview and Watt, and I don't know if you've seen that hotel lately, nothing good is going on in that hotel. <laughs> Everything bad it's a red light is happening there. Stuff that you shouldn't even know about at your tender age, but that that crappy whatever hotel was going to be where that seven acre preserve what is now, and the seven acres is there, and there's a family of red tail hawks that lives right by that bridge, and they use that as foraging, so it's it's a very valuable, and it also has it's one of the only. Um, Seasonal wetlands that's left along Arcade Creek. All the other wetlands have been filled in. And so there's that, if you've gone down and seen that little swale, and I don't think that's one of your study sites, but it probably should be at some point. There's a, there's a, a natural little swale there, um, which is different than every, every other type of wetland along the creek. So um, that's my shout out to the Arcade Creek project. You have helped, uh, helped stop that. Industrial development, and then a few years ago, I was in this very same room encouraging the students to help help me fight a disc golf course that the city built was building over along Auburn Boulevard, and it was going to be a tournament level 18-hole golf course built into what was the nature area. And um, I called when they were laying the concrete pad. The concrete pad for each one of the golf stations was the size of this table. I mean, they, and they were cutting the trees and everything. And I said, well, how could you do this? This is conflicts with the, 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 the park master plan of 1985. And they said, what park master plan? So they said that they had lost all the documents and they lost the city council resolution. They didn't have that material. And we fought, and it was a several year fight. And ultimately, they went and picked up, got all the concrete out. And I, I endured very personal attacks. It was very ugly. But it was the right thing to do. And again, the IB students were crucial in that because you know why? It doesn't matter what a 50-year-old guy says. But city council members live in fear of having young people oppose stuff that they do. And I told them, and it, you know what? It never did go to a city council meeting. Because I was thought, I said, bring it on. And the IB students were on. They started a, this is like, I didn't even know what Facebook was at the time. <laughs> um, but they were like, we started a Facebook group. I'm like, OK, is that good? I mean, it's like, what's that? What's that going to do? And, and, and I said, OK, have the meeting. And, and I'm going to have at least 50 students from the IB class there. They did not want to have that meeting. And they postponed it twice and ultimately just gave the order to clear out the, clear out the thing, because they didn't want to see the IB students there. So you, you have actually a lot more power than you think you have. Um, and and um, again, I'm grateful. Well, so let's go down to the San Joaquin Valley. This is the great San Joaquin River, or what was the once great San Joaquin River. There's a break right here. People often call this the San Joaquin Valley too, but it's not really. It's the Tulare Valley. And there's a San Joaquin Valley. It comes again out of, there's, there's um, 
oh, Kings Canyon National Park and Sequoia National Park and Yosemite and all that stuff. All that, all that good water comes down here. And, but now a bunch of dams have been built, but ultimately in its original condition it would flow north out through the delta. And Tulare Lake, this again, once vast lake filled with wildlife, was drained and is now a just little tiny square. And all the, all the fresh water is diverted out of it. So what kind of things do we see down in the San Joaquin Valley? One of my favorites, I hope one of your favorites too, who can name it? Huh? Come on, Bert. Is that you? You get 25 points for at least getting the right. <laughs> Who can name this? Come on, you see these over at the creek. Sacro Sand. I'll give you a hand. This is the only place in the world they exist. Yes. The Acorn Woodpecker. Thank you so much. Yeah. Does anybody have do a better haircut mind. than this bird? Look at that. But cool, I mean, that bird is such a cool bird. Um, you can see it, it's living in, a, in a, a softwood tree here. They are colony nesters. They live in these huge groups. Um, they're very gregarious, as you may know. And when it's time for the acorns to drop, they are in a pitched battle with the magpies and the, and the scrub jays over the acorns supply. So these are some of the creatures we see, again, the, the, the endemic species, species that occur nowhere else part of that whole Mediterranean climate. This is, a, this is a painting of the San Joaquin River in its original state. What do you think all these are? Fish. What kind of fish? Salmon. salmon. It was one of the biggest salmon runs in the world. I think it numbered like up to 300,000 individuals that salmon run. Wow. Destroyed. Gone off the face of the earth. That's why this is a picture. We don't have, or a painting, we don't have pictures of it. Uh, it was intentionally destroyed when they built uh, the Bryant Dam as part of the state water project yesterday. What time was it? What year? That was going, that is, um, I think that was 1960. Um, and, and so that's destroyed. I'm actually working right now on a strategy to, to partner with other agencies and nonprofit organizations to revive the river. And it's very, talk about complicated. Do your homework because we need you to be the next generation. I was in a meeting the other day I, I and I said, I hope we're educating some really smart high school students because this is really complicated. And it's going to take many generations to fix the San Joaquin River. When the San Joaquin River and the Sacramento River, which is part of the Arcade Creek project, go down into the delta, they coalesce. Fortunately, this is a place we can take a picture. This is along the Casumnas River. It's the only undammed river of the Central Valley. All the other dams have, all the other rivers have dams on it. It's the only uncontrolled river, which means it has big floods and dries out too. It's actually, um, one of the reasons it didn't get a dam, it, it never was seen as that valuable for water supply by the, the people who built the dams and stuff. It was sort of like, we'll, we'll get to that later. And, they, and by the time they got around to damming it, and there's still proposals out there to dam it, um, people started purchasing land along the river to create the Casamas River Preserve. It's in the south part of Sacramento County. That would also be a good field trip for, for all of you. On the Sacramento County, San Joaquin uh, County border. But the interesting thing is, is, and the reason I have this picture up here, is, is, this, is what the, this is what the Central Valley looked like. It, it was a flooded regime, it, 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 and these are oak trees, and people say, well, oak trees don't like water. Well, oak trees are actually fine with water if they've grown up in water. And so these are, these are trees that are accustomed, and this is very much for any of you who've ever been to Louisiana or Georgia or something, it's sort of like the bayou down in, in the southeast of the U.S. And then um, a little further downstream, here's Delta Meadows. The reason I have this picture on is this is the only sort of intact part of the Delta, of what gives you a sense of what the Delta once looked like. How many people have spent any time on the Delta, on a houseboat or water skis or whatever? I figured the teacher's dead. I got married on the Delta. You got married on the, down at the Wright Hotel? Yeah, at the Wright Hotel. Excellent, <laughs> beautiful. This is the Delta. Um, oh. The delta is pretty much all has been denuded and it's been turned into levees, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, but we're going to, I, I got some pictures of the delta too, uh, of the different different eco regions or different geographical regions of the delta. And so the, the south delta, the central delta, the eastern delta, right there is where I just that, had that picture. There's the Casumnas and McCollumie River confluence, the north delta, 
which you, you folks are contributing to, the West Delta. This has got problems, and I'm going to tell you about that. And then this is Carquina Straits and stuff. But the Delta is very distinct. Each of these areas is very different ecologically and culturally as well. What are some amazing facts? For 6,000 years, sediment and tules formed the peat soils of the Delta. Peat soils are largely vegetative soils, like 90% of the peat soils comes from decomposed vegetation. When we think of soil around here, if we're any of you have dug holes over at the creek, it's a lot of clay, very hard. These peat soils are very soft, very light and fluffy. Um, the, the delta, um, uh, 50 percent, about 50 percent of the state's total uh, freshwater runoff goes through the delta. That's a lot of water. Uh, or it was at least headed toward the delta and gets diverted. The watershed of the estuary covers uh, 45 percent of the state's surface area. So it gives you a sense of 45 percent of California. California is 100 million acres. So 45 million acres is within the Bay Delta watershed. And you have a piece of that with Arcade Creek. Um, what's some more amazing facts? Freshwater and seawater mix in the estuary. 750 species of flora and fauna. Up to 65% of the Delta's freshwater is diverted. So here's an here's a ecosystem that was actually evolved with a pretty delicate balance between saltwater coming in from the ocean and freshwater coming in. And we're just sucking 65% of that fresh water right off the top for industry, for agriculture, for, for drinking water, et cetera, et cetera. The San Joaquin River, the beleaguered San Joaquin River, we already wiped out its fish populations. We've taken, we take so much water out of the, that river that when they pump the water out of the South Delta, South Delta, the water moves backward in the river. That's how screwed up it is. The water is going backward. So it's not much of a river right now. Um, the trade-off for that is that California produces 50% of the country's fruits and vegetables and 20% of the nation's milk. So what does it look like from the air? South Bay, Central Bay, San Pablo Bay, Sassoon Bay, and Sassoon Marsh, and that's going to fa factor into this story. There's the Yolo Bypass. Look, it's flooded. That's an intentional bypass where it's actually one of the best water control projects there is because it functions like a floodplain still. And then you, you nice people are up there somewhere. Um, here's the South Delta where we divert the water out of. Uh, it's an amazing system. Prior to European settlement, the wild rivers of California produced millions of salmon. In the early 1900s, there were 21 canneries in California processing 5 million pounds of salmon annually. Um, here is the Delta smelt. People who don't like environmentalists and don't like nature very much will always say, you're, you're choking off our industry and our water supplies for some stupid fish. Well, here's the stupid fish. This is the, <laughs> this is the Delta smelt. It, again, is unique. I, I'm told that if you smell it, it smells like a cucumber. I'm not sure why. What, that matters, but it is unique. It doesn't occur anywhere else in the world, yet another endemic species. Again, the, 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 the ecological significance of California. So what did we do to that bounty? We had all those, those Native American tribes who lived thousands of years. Everything was cool. They, 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 they actually ground their acorns. You can see where they ground their acorns into the rocks. They lived in peace and harmony and all that stuff. They actually burned parts of California, they manage its vegetation, they manage the games that the Native Americans really had it figured out. Uh, the Europeans show up and they said, let's do some, let's get some money out of this thing. It's not, so what did they create? This is incredibly ingenious actually, but these hydraulic um, hoses, they literally blasted apart the rivers. Um, this is all gravity fed, it's not like pumped or anything, but they, they, they and, and we're still dealing with the legacy of this today, all the, the abandoned mines and all the damage. They just pulverized the rivers, they pulverized the mountains, all to get um, gold. And then they, they pulverized, they, they, they dug mines in the uh, central coast to get mercury out to amalgamate the gold, which Cindy's husband is trying to fix that problem. They, they, they got all the wealth and, and created all the damage and then just walked away, rich and, and drunk and, and everything. <laughs> so, um, uh, then later, uh, a little bit more sophisticated, we started building gigantic dams 
This is a Shasta Dam, one of the biggest dams in the world. Um, from an engineering perspective, beautiful, right? But again, it was built without the fish in mind and pretty much brought to extinction the winter run salmon. So uh, yet another species of salmon um, brought to virtually to extinction. Um, this is the Harvey O. Banks pumping plant. So in the southern south delta, which you saw pictures of, this is, this, this is the business end of the, the delta. This is where they're extracting all those the hundreds of millions of gallons of fresh water out of the South Bay. So massive amounts of infrastructure uh, built in. I mentioned the Yolo uh, bypass. Um, I'm, I'm, I love old postcards. I found this, wow. this crazy yeah. postcard of the Yolo bypass. It looks like it looks um, today. Except the, probably all going up to a Sunday picnic or something. So quaint and everything. It is. It 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 was built, um, you know, just as a bypass. What the, the scientists from UC Davis are finding, though, that the, the bypass is one of the best ecological flood control channels anywhere because it behaves like a floodplain. And so, um, when the water starts getting high on the Sacramento River before it floods here. It is shunted out into the bypass, and you probably have all gone across the bypass, and it just looks like a huge inland sea. Um, the native the native fish go out, and they're foraging out there, and they're eating, and they're getting nutrition. And because they are native to the system, they know when the water starts going back in the river, hey, hey, guys, let's get back in the river. And the, the non-native fish that are out there thinking, wow, this is great, look at all this food, they and they're not cued into these cycles. A lot of them die. They're not. They they, they die, and the, the the native fish get back into the the river, and they prosper. So here is the plumbing system for the great state of California. Um, I have worked on this ecosystem for my, basically my whole career. I still can't figure all this stuff out. It just the, the, the water going north, south, east, and west, uphill, downhill. Uh, it, it's just crazy. Um, again, the engineering marvels. Um, the result of that is we, we, the, 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 the rivers have lost their ability to produce fish. Well, when you think about it, I mean, that, that came naturally. That's an ecosystem service. That's what, if we would have just left nature alone, we would have had all this great food. But we, we made the trade off. No, we want the water for other things. And so now the fish are in hatcheries. Well, you probably have all studied hatchery stuff and how that messes up the genetics of the fish. And in some cases, because the, the rivers are blocked, they have to like raise the fish and put the fish in trucks and then move, take them, go to get to one part of the river and then they got to get them back out and like put them back in the truck and move them to another part of the river. It's just like the, the fishes, or some fish populations actually migrate in trucks rather than migrating in the water. So it's, it's crazy. What did we get for all that? Well, we got the land of fruits and nuts. <laughs> Raisins and citrus and almonds and walnuts, all good stuff. I also, I, I, this has no relevance at all. I just like this fruit label. Um, <laughs> they, they, there, there's a whole cultural thing behind the fruit industry and all these different packing labels and stuff. And, uh, but because the people who were farming weren't necessarily tuned into organic food and all that stuff, Remember that beautiful valley and stuff? Well, we turn it into basically industrial agriculture. This is like, you know, there's not, there's no vegetation apparent in this. This is down in the Southern San Joaquin Valley. Um, not only, it wasn't good enough just to extract, to, to, to mine the soil for food. We also, let's drill some oil out there too. Let's get some of that going on. So we're drilling it for oil and all that. Does it, do you think anybody who's involved with this picture is thinking about nature or that little acorn woodpecker? I don't think they care, <laughs> which is too bad. Um, because of this sort of industrial mining of the soil for agriculture, um, the people who work the land, the migrants from Mexico, not very well treated, that brought then another cultural response. Cesar Chavez, you can see, I love this one of my favorite pictures. His shirt here is made of protest signs. Mm. And there's the United Farm Workers emblem here, and you see the skulls of all the, the, the Mexican laborers who were poisoned by the industrial agriculture. That was, we, you know, when we were growing up, Cesar Chavez was on the news every night. The newest wave is the, the Hmong farmers down in the, the San Joaquin Valley uh, in the Fresno area, and they are now taking up uh, the cause of workers' rights and, and agriculture. In the, in the central, uh, in the delta, there was a large Chinese um, population that was brought in to 
to work on the railroads to build the levees because um, the, the engineers didn't like the delta, very inconvenient. All this flood water and all these wetlands and stuff, we gotta, so, but it's too much of a hassle to work on it, so let's get some, let's get some labor in here. So they brought over um, loads of Chinese people. This is down in Locke. Has anyone here been to Locke down, you've been down to Locke? Um, it's, a, it's a Chinese community that is still there. Um, another old picture of Locke, the Delta Club. So oh, wow. when they did scratch together enough money, they could at least go have, you know, have a drink or something or go to a dance. I talked about the peat soils earlier, and here's what happened to the peat soils. All this, the soil here is all this vegetation mass. 90% of the peat soil is, veg, is, is decomposed vegetation. So they brought in the Chinese to build the levees so that the European settlers and so forth could farm. Um, but the peat soils are extremely fragile. They also, and so they started blowing away. And then when they, when they made their crop, when they grew their crops, they would burn actually the crop residue. Well, peat is because it's mostly vegetation also burns. So they used to burn the peat. And because they were with, um, doing water withdrawals and so forth, the, the peat started sinking. And so now what we have is, this is what the delta looks like today, is you have, and like on top of these levees, this is where the roads are. Look at where the water is and look at where the bottom of the island is. These used to be the island. Now the island's way down here. This is a, a great risk of collapse. And this is also one of the things I'm working on is trying to reverse that process and regrow the peat in certain areas. Because all of our water infrastructure, all 25 million Californians rely on fresh water from the Delta. This could all be lost in a matter of seconds. If there's a big earthquake and those levees start falling, it's going to be like dominoes because they're going to fall. And then the water's going to rush in. It's going to rush to the next levee. That domino is going to fall. And all that seawater is going to go intrude into the Delta. And our, our drinking water is going to be ruined. And we don't have a backup plan. It's not like, oh, OK, if that happens, we'll get the water from no. There is no, nobody's thought of the other what happens. Mm -hmm. um, in the worst case scenario, I heard in the Western Delta, 25 feet below sea level is where the bottom of those islands are. This is a crisis uh, waiting to happen. It's one of the things I told Cindy that um, one reason I wanted to give you this presentation is there's a big push on right now to fix various Bay Delta things. You're going to read this in the news. That's why I wanted to give you this kind of overview today because some of this stuff will start making sense as you look at the newspaper. Or, well, you don't look at newspapers. When you look at the computer, and <laughs> read, read about that. Um, this is what a Delta levy failure looks like. This is 2004 at Jones Track. The interesting thing for me on this is like nothing was going on. It wasn't like, oh my god, the storm is so bad and the levees are going to... No, it's just like we woke up one day and it's like, whoa, the levee's gone. I mean, it wasn't like a catastrophic event. So you can imagine, remember, Central Valley want, is a bathtub. It wants to be an inland sea. It is naturally flood prone. You get a big storm, it's going to blow the levees out, or you get that earthquake I was just talking about. Well, what else have we done around to, to benefit the Bay Delta? Oh, God, I guess we built a bunch of homes. Uh, that's not necessarily bad. I'm, I'm from the suburbs. I think suburbs are a really bad land use plan because, you know, all these people are in their own little world. It's not very pedestrian friendly. They didn't think about infiltration. They probably paved over some wetlands there, too. Um, when all these people move in and they want to have their yards, what do you think they use? They got, oh, what are these bugs? Let's get some, hey, let's go to the problem solver and spray the, the pesticides. So all this stuff ends up in the Bay Delta too. All the pesticides from Monsanto and Orco and all these companies, they, they solve the problem of whatever bugs on your plant, but they cause problems because it goes into the creeks and then kills stuff. And you probably, I don't know if you take measures, of, of pollutants, but that you probably find the petrochemicals. Um, we also have invasive species moving into the, the Bay Delta. It's one of the most invaded estuaries in the world. This is an overbite clam. You can see this is a small clam, but when you when you take about you know hundreds of millions of these things, they are actually changing the food budget for the whole Bay Delta. They are they are eating so much food that the native fish don't have enough food to live on. Um, and then you have other people who decided that the, the northern pike, boy, wouldn't that be nice to have that in the Bay Delta? Well, this is, 
This is from a different place in the world altogether. It's one of the most voracious predators. So even in these, these efforts where we're trying to bring the salmon back, we're bringing the little salmon back. Well, this thing is a salmon munching machine. Um, it's up in Lake Davis. We've been trying to kill it for like at least 15, 20 years. Um, and the big fear is it's going to get loose in the great ecosystem. So the bottom line here is, is um, and I'm almost done here because I'm 34 minutes in, uh, all the main fish populations have crashed. The threadfin shad, shad striped bass, delta smelt, longtail smelt, smelt, as all the trends are going down, 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 down. So we, um, and this is where I'm, I'm going to finish because this is the latest thing I'm working on, is how do we reverse some of these declines? And this is, at the early part of my talk, I said, look at that one place of the, where Six Sassoon Marsh and Six Sassoon Bay is, and, and this is one of the ideas, is that um, because of all that development in the delta, where we wiped out the wetlands and turned them into those agricultural fields, this is the last place sort of in that area, in that region of the Bay Delta ecosystem, where there's still sort of shallow native habitat intermixed with natural wetlands. Uh, these have invasive species problems and stuff too, but they're basically functioning well. And, and the, the goal here is, is that for these resident fishes, the smaller fishes, like the delta smelt, which I showed you the picture of, which is endangered, and some of the other, the Sacramento split tail and things like that, we want to move them down into this area so they have a more hospitable environment. Because up in the delta, where they put all those levees, the fish are just in these, they're, they're basically squeezed in these trapezoidal channels, no vegetation, no cover, very little food, hot temperatures, all that stuff. We need them to be more luxurious down here in the cool water where they can hide and there's more fish and food and stuff like that. The fish populations, and this is what you got to remember, is they basically like a two parts per thousand salinity zone. Any fresher, and then it's sort of a freshwater fish thing. That's for the, that's for the, the, the trout, the lake trout and things like that. An estuarine species is used to this mix of saltwater, freshwater, the brackish water. Um, but if it's too salty, then it's too much like the ocean, and they don't like that either. They, they, they die. So the, the trick is, is how do we get them down into Sassoon Bay? Well, look at this picture here. Here's six parts per thousand. Oh, my God, it's way up here in the delta. Remember, here's the Yolo Bypass. You guys, there's an Arcade Creek right up here by the sad fish. Um, and the best, the, two, the best salinity, look, it's stuck in these deep delta channels. Well, this is like a very hostile place for a little fish to be down in those channels. So what we're trying to do is work on a, we're, we're about ready to launch a big scientific endeavor on how can we manage the estuary different to push that two parts per thousand salinity downstream so that the fish end up here. And that's going to take a lot of water and that's why it's politically very difficult to do. Um, but here's what happens is that you move you move the two parts per thousand down into your desirable zone. And if the fish, if we can manage the fish here while we go into the delta and actually create wetlands in the delta, and that's what we need. The reason we've got to put the fish down here is because it's the only place the wetlands and the shallow beneficial habitat is. If we can turn the tide here and do restoration of this western delta and get those two reintroduced water and wetlands to start building the peat soils back up, then we can manage, though we'll have more flexibility, we can manage the system so that there's also the fish up in here. But for now, for probably the next 10 or 20 years, we're going to need to try to get the fish down there. That's the political difficulty, because can you imagine how much fresh water it takes to push the salinity downstream? And just remember, here's where we're going. We're going from there to there. That is a lot of water. That's going to take, and that's going to have to, it's either going to have to come out of agriculture or municipal water supplies or maybe both. And, but, but don't worry, these are only, this is all who we have to coordinate with. Uh, that is a lot of organizations, everybody's got a different opinion. This is what makes the Bay Delta ecosystem difficult to manage, is everybody has a different idea and a different interest of what should happen here. But you have the flood control, risk reduction people, you got the water supply people, you got the ecosystem restoration. And uh, all those people got to get in on the same page somehow. And it's going to take political leadership, and unfortunately, that is in short supply right now in our country. Uh, what, it, what? And this is, I'm about ready to finish up here, the goals for the Bay Delta then. My prescription, and I haven't cleared this with my management, but this is, I'm, I'm giving you my five-point plan 
<laughs> Reintroduce natural processes. Don't have fish migrating downstream in a diesel truck. Get them back in the river. Make it nice. Get some floodplains and wetlands repairing forest going. Move that low salinity zone downstream yeah, so that the fish can be in more hospitable uh, areas down into Sassoon Bay. Reduce the water pollution, the mercury, the selenium, the, the, um, the temperature, you know, high temperature is considered a water uh, pollutant. Um, and fix the delta plumbing because um, it's not working right now. We have all that infrastructure, but because, because of the earthquake risk or the flood risk and the potential loss of the delta levees, uh, we have got to figure out a different way of getting our fresh water from the Delta so that we can avert a crisis. And meanwhile, nature hangs on. And the Pacific chorus frog, or the tree frog, this is a success story because are you, um, have you been over there and saw the detention basin over at the creek? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, over off Auburn Boulevard, they, they, they recontoured that and they, they have a big uh, artificial wetland over there. Have you seen that? Have you, you been over there? They built that to maybe go over there and run around a little bit in that, that thing. I mean, it's, I think it's dry right now, but they, they built it as part of the Clean Water Act requirements of the federal and state government said to the city of Sacramento, you've got to get your pollution under control that's coming off the suburbs. All the soap and stuff from people washing their cars and the pesticides people are pouring on their yards. Um, so they intercept that water into that little detention basin and it's naturally treated by the plants. And it, 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 the plants actually sequester the pollutants and they also settle out and then are, are decomposed with, with photo, photo degradation. There's probably some residual, but then the water cycles back in. I should have had a map of this thing up. It cycle it goes back into Arky Creek as all purified and clean. Um, and they didn't design it for the frogs, but the frogs who have been hanging on for years at Arcade Creek are now in perfusion. There's probably a population of five to five to five or ten thousand frogs over there now, where for years and years there was maybe probably total less than a hundred along the creek. So th this is a success story, and it shows if you work with nature. Nature is resilient. Nature wants to come back, but don't push nature too far to where nature can't recover. And that's where we're kind of at right now. So that's my presentation. Thank you for being such a great audience.